to Genesis 3. Say, neighbor, when was the last time you read Genesis? Say, neighbor, I know you've been reading the Gospels. I know you've been reading the Apostle Paul and the letters to the church, and some of you have snuck out even in the reading the second last book, Jude, and I know you've read some of the prophets, but when was the last time you read the book of Genesis? Say Genesis. Genesis is about paradise lost. Say paradise lost. The third chapter, paradise lost. Say paradise lost. But it's also about paradise found. Say paradise found. That's a marvelous thing to know that you can lose paradise and you can also gain it again. It's about paradise loss or what we call the great fall. Say the great fall. It is the fall of Humpty Dumpty. You know, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's men and all the king horses couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you were that Humpty Dumpty. But say, neighbor, you can get back up again. Genesis is a marvelous, marvelous book. It is a book written by one of the most marvelous writers of all history. His name is, can you believe this, Moses. Moses is called the great liberator or the great emancipator. Say liberator, emancipator. Of those people who were called the children of Israel even before they had, all, before they had landed, in the promised land. Y'all need to get that. E even before they had entered into the promised land, Moses called them, called them the children of Israel. And wait, wait, the reason why he calls them that is because he, he wants them to believe that they are already where they need to be even before they get there. Y'all get that later on. He, he calls them the children of Israel. The promised seed of God, he calls them the blessed children of Israel even before they ever get there. He's trying to emphasize what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, you've got to sometimes walk in your anointing and your consecration even before you walk into the land of blessing. You've got to believe in advance that what I ask God for, it's already I wish I had some woke up folk right now. Already done. You've got to believe that what I'm praying for, God has already commissioned his angels in heaven to, des to descend down and to bring what I've already asked for in advance. You ought to see in foresight what God is going to do in the future, even while I'm yet in the present. Sometimes you ought to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, say neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Look at your husband and say, husband. Look at your wife and say, husband. Wife, say, I see you in the future, but you look better in the future than you do. All right, I know, I know some, it's just too early for them because they said, no, they still got their morning look on. They got their morning face. They are called the children of Israel even before they get there. Say, children of Israel before they get there. And so what, what Moses does is he's the emancipator. He's the, he's, the, he's the liberator of the children of Israel. He brings them out of the bondage and the land of Egypt and takes them almost to the curb of the promised land. And even though he does not get there, he already gets a vision from God what the promised land is going to look like. He's a marvelous writer. Say marvelous writer. And, and so he writes... The beginning story, say the beginning story. When God says in the very beginning in Genesis 1, let us do some things. God says, let us. I like that. Because sometimes, uh, pastor, I need the usness of God. I need God to work on my behalf. I need the Son of God to work on my behalf. And every now and then, when y'all come to church on Sunday morning and forgot that the Holy Spirit is active already in your life, I have to ask for the usness of God, that I need the Holy Spirit to invade this atmosphere. Have I got one witness in the house? Y'all get it later on. When you wake up, you'll go home and you'll say, I should have got that earlier. 
Genesis is a marvelous, marvelous book, but the third chapter is a great book because it talks about paradise lost. Now, when most people read the book of Genesis and the third chapter where you have the great fall of man and even some of the other events that occur prior to Genesis 3, there are those who argue that this is not to be taken uh, in a literal sense, but rather, uh, this, this ought not to be taken in a literal sense, but rather, it is all a metaphor. It is all similes. It, it, it's something else. It's a different kind of understanding. It did not really happen the way it said it happened. When the Bible talks about, for example, when the Bible talks about it took six days for the creation to occur and God rest on the seventh day, you're not to take that literally because we know that the earth and the creation and the heaven and earth and all of this stuff could not have been done in seven days, but that is a metaphor, say me metaphor. It, it is a kind of simile, it is a kind of similarity, there is a kind of deep meaning behind it. So what happens in the book of Genesis, especially the first three chapters, did not really, really happen. It is to be taken, uh, not literally, maybe it's fiction, but I think it is both truth, I think it's to be taken literally and metaphorically, say literally and metaphorically. What happens in Genesis 3 actually does happen. You ask me, how did it happen? Maybe this is too early for y'all this morning. You ask me, how did it happen? How could it happen? I tell you this, I can only respond this way, that God can do anything. And that God can do anything. Let me slow down. He can do anything and everything that he desires to do. And he has a mind of his own. Have I got a witness? And so some have said that the story of the man of man's fall should be cast aside as fiction. Others thought it to be metaphoric and allegory, which means that it has spiritual meaning and not to be understood in the literal sense. But I think that the story of the creation of man and also the fall of man ought to be taken both literally and allegorically. What happens here in the third chapter of Genesis literally occurred. There was a garden. And the garden was a paradise. There was a man by the name of Adam, and there was a, man, a woman by the name of Eve. And there was a tree in the center of the garden. And the devil does show up. Y'all need to get this. I know that the devil shows up because every now and then he shows up in my life. Every now and then, the devil even comes through that front door. And sometimes, the devil even sits next to you. Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you the devil? My God, if they respond yes, you get up and go on to the other side of church. Say, the devil does show up. And in the book of Genesis, the third chapter, there's something else that shows up, and it's sin. Say sin. Sin is real. Sin does happen. But for the first time, not only does the devil show up, but sin shows up. Satan shows up. But while sin and Satan shows up, God, y'all got that. One person in the house got that. Where sin abounds, grace Oh, you ought to be happy right now. I was sinking deep in sin, far from a peaceful shore, sinking deeply, stained within, never to rise no more. But God showed up. Have I got a witness? That's what Good Friday is all about. It's about God dying on the cross for us, going to a grave because of our sin. What kills Jesus is not the soldiers, it's not the cross, it's really sin. Sin laid him on the cross. Sin sent him down to the bottomless pit. But I'll stop by to tell you, it was God who showed up on Sunday morning. And somebody said, early Sunday morning, God showed up, touched the body of his son Jesus, and he rose from the grave. Have I got a witness in the house? You might have not heard it lately, but I'll stop by to tell you that sin shows up, but also God. Mm, 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 mm. Because what's associated with sin, as you will see in this third chapter, is fear and shame. Hmm. Y'all might get... turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, 
pastor ain't no psychologist, but he is a preacher. What is associated? We're saying sometimes the, the, the problem is not what you think the problem is. I'm, I wish somebody would pray with me. Y'all stop praying all of a sudden. What you think the problem is is not. Uh, the problem may not be another person. The problem may not be another thought. The problem may not be a certain kind of walk. The problem may not really be a certain kind of an attitude. The problem may not be a new day or an old day or yesterday or today. The problem can simply be this thing called sin. The text says, all right, I'll get to it later. Y'all need to exercise. Can y'all just stand up and do this here? Just stand up. Just stand, everybody stand up. Y'all not going to kill me today. So I'm nice. Come on, I'm, I'm nice. Just say, everybody stand up. Is it too hard to stand up? Y'all can do it. Come on, Sheila. Y'all can do it. Everybody stand up. <sighs> just say, just breathe in. <laughs> just breathe in. <sighs> Three times. Come on, breathe in. <sighs> Now just take a big stretch and, and hit the person next to you. Ah, one to the right. Ah, one to the left. One forward. Ah, come on, come on, come on. One backward. Ah, oh. Now y'all go back and sit down. Sin crept in. Y'all, y'all, not, not gonna kill me, Larry. Y'all gonna die first. I ain't that. Sin crept in. Where was I at? Where was I at? Where was I at? The Bible says that the devil comes in, and when the devil comes in, sin comes in, and the problem is not this, that, or the other, but the problem is sin. Say sin. And, and sometimes if you're going to take, take something for it, you can't take aspirin. You can't take all kinds of sedative. You can't take a drink. You've got to learn how not to take a drug, but take God. <laughs> Try Jesus. He's a way out of no way. He's a rock in a weary land. King Jesus can roll all my burdens away. The problem is, here comes Satan. He creeps into the garden. There is Adam and Eve there. He goes to Eve first, and he asks Eve a particular question, and, and all of a sudden, Eve uh, bites the, uh, the forbidden fruit, takes part in the forbidden fruit. And the text says that what is associated with her sin is this thing called fear. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve are afraid. And sometimes uh, you can deal with your fear and being afraid of certain kinds of things when you handle the sin question. In the Old Testament, the Bible says that sometimes sin lieth at the door. And if you deal with our sins, if you deal with that kind of a thing, don't call it something else, but call it what it is. It is sin. If you deal with sin, it sometimes eliminates the, the fear and the shame. Y'all awful quiet. Because the Bible says that after they have fallen from grace, all of a sudden they begin to clothe themselves because they see now that they are naked. Now, before they could expose every part of who they were to God, even their nakedness. But now they cannot even expose to God their nakedness. They cannot expose to God who they really are because they have now sinned. And with the sin comes fear. And the Bible says that they begin to hide out from God when you sin you ultimately hide out from God but I stop by to tell you that you can't really hide out from God you cannot really hide out from him because the Bible says whether shall I go or whether shall I flee I, if I go to the uttermost parts of the of the world then God is there if I go down to the bottomless part of, of hell itself God is there if I look to the right God is there if I look to the left God is there I see him in front of me I see him in behind me in fact God is everywhere and not only is God everywhere I'm not present but God is also omniscient which means there is nothing I can hide from God because God already knows he not only knows my sin but he also knows what I stand in the need of even before the need is ever presented before him he just wants to hear from me what is it that you want from me I'm God I already know I can fix it I can I'm talking to somebody today. I can handle whatever you're dealing with because I'm God and what are you worried about you worried about the economy you worried about who's in the White House 
you worry about if you're gonna wake up in the morning you worried about some other person what are you worried about you worry you can't handle this thought you can't handle this what what are you worried about you now become old what are you worried about the same God who brought you from a mighty long ways is the same God who will take you to a mighty long ways have I got a witness in the house if I get sick he's still a doctor in a sick room if I gotta go to court he's still a lawyer in a courtroom when my mind is messed up I don't have to take pills he's a mind regulator when the doctor say my heart is messed up Reverend use he's a heart fixer and he'll fix it every time I'm God all by myself you can't hide anything from God because God already knows he knows my ups and he knows my downs come on stand on your feet he already knows the devil shows up Larry and the Bible says in Genesis 3 now say now the serpent shows up now the serpent shows up now I asked you whether or not this is to be interpreted literally or figuratively metaphorically is there something else that God is trying to to tell us I think that this is not to be taken literally you know some of you when you think in terms of the serpent showing up in the form of the devil showing up in the form of a serpent you see snakes rattlesnakes you see animals you see something that is ugly. And so when we think in terms of the devil, we think that the devil always shows up in red tights, horns, pitchforks, long tails. When you think about the devil, you think about movies of demonic imps and how they look like monsters. But can I give you a lesson today? Paul said that Satan comes in the form of light. That, that, that 1 Corinthians talks about him, 2 Corinthians talk about him coming as light and as a shining. Y'all need to get this today. I know I'm just talking to myself. A self, he comes as a shining light. In, in other words, Satan doesn't come looking all ugly and carrying on, but rather Satan comes looking all good. He's cunning. He's slick. He's slick. He's attractive. He, he doesn't come looking like the bum, the bum on the street. He doesn't come looking like what we used to call hoboish and all of that kind of... No, no. He comes as a shining light. He comes to attract you he comes in attractive kind of a way he pres he presents to you attractive kinds of ideas concepts he, he tells you that that you can have this that and the other when it's really no good and he talks to you not in a loud angry voice but rather he's cool calm and collective he speaks in your ears and he tells you you ought to do this that and another it's okay you're just human it's no problem with it and he talks to you in a not as a evil monstrous kind of a person but rather he comes as a shining light and sometimes when you're looking at people in situations that comes to you you ought to say to that person that thing that idea get away from me because I know Satan when I see him he doesn't come in a demonic kind of a way as we understand it. he's not a serpent he's not a snake he doesn't come like that he comes as a shining light in fact the Old Testament says 
He's the head of the, of the choir. He is the director of the choir. And when he walks, the text says that he even sounds like music by himself. He is attractive because a whole lot of angels said, hey, let's follow Satan. Look at Satan. He even looks better than God. And God says, where anything looks better than me or think they're better than me, I've got to put them out. That's why God sometimes allows us to go to the cuttermost places of earth because he's trying to get Satan. Look at it. He said, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Metaphorically, he is sharp than any beast, any animal, any creation. And he said to the woman, watch this. Here's how Satan worked. Has God indeed said? Has God said? Did God really say that? And if God really said I'm, I'm, I'm talking metaphorically to somebody. You know what I'm saying. If God really said that, th is that what he really mean? Th does he really mean bring your last to him? Does he really mean give him the time? 10% and I'm making $100,000 a year. And at the end of the day, you talking about, does God really want me to give $10,000? Does God really say, does it really mean trust him? in all my ways lean not upon my own understanding and he will direct my the, 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 does God really mean that when I go to the hospital and the doctor said I got cancer that he can heal me of cancer does God really mean for me to act this way and that way like a Christian or really, does he really just want me to be a Christian in my heart not in my walk in my talk does God really mean has God really said that has God really said, do not render evil for evil, but rather render good for evil? Does God really mean that I can't turn around and slap somebody down, cuss them out when I really ought to and they know they deserve it? Does God really mean that I'm going to allow somebody to slap me on my right side and then turn to the left and say, try it again? Has God really said, God has he said that? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst, in the center of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, shall or nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, Hey, baby, sweetheart, gorgeous, beautiful. I'm Dabadiri. Uh, the truth of the matter is, with my bare white voice, you, no, no, you, you will not surely die. Oh, for here is what the issue is. God knows that in. Uh, the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He didn't really mean that. He knows that the moment you partake of this forbidden fruit, you will be like God. And, and, and that really is the problem with our world today. we all trying to be our own God. We're trying to determine our destiny. We're trying to handle our own problem when we need to learn how to turn it over to Jesus and let him work it out. The text says, so the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took up the fruit and she ate it. What is it that Satan wants us to do? He wants us to bite the wrong stuff, participate in the wrong thing. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. And watch this, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering 
But then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He still came after them. He still met with them. He still had his meeting place and his meeting time with them. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden because they were now afraid and ashamed. Their sin had found them out. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to Adam, he doesn't say, Adam in a main cattle, where are you, Adam? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Where are you? No, no. He says in a very nice voice. Adam, where are you? I came to meet you at the same time in the same place. I love you so much, Adam. I love Eve, your wife. What has happened? You have sown fig leaves. You're trying to cover yourself, Adam. But what can wash away your sin is not fig leaves. The problem is you're trying to get right with fig leaves. You're dependent upon fig leaves, and fig leaves will ultimately waste away. We've got to do something different for you, Adam. I love you so much. We got to, we got to cover you up, and fig leaves will not cover you. But rather, I have to go and slay an animal and put animal skin. Blood has to flow because you have to have a blood religion. You cannot have a fig, fig leaf religion because fig leaves will not do you. When you come down to the chilly banks of, of Jordan, fig leaves will not take you across. When you start to have issues in your life, you cannot cover them up with fig leaves. When, when folk come up against you, you cannot deal with them with fig leaves. When you're trying to handle the troubles of the world, fig leaves won't do it. When you go down to the valley called shadow of death, fig leaves won't handle you. Rather, I've got to cover you with something it's got to be blood and a blood sacrifice but guess what this will only do because one day I'm gonna unroll myself and I'm coming down 42 long generation and I'm going to cover you with my blood what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus not fig leaves fig leaves what are fig leaves thinking a certain kind of way positive thinking will never get you through what can wash away my sins nothing well I'll get myself and hook myself up with this dude fig leaves well I'll get all of this money and I'll accumulate a lot of stuff and it will make me happy and you will discover fig leaves I'll get into this kind of relationship or I hold on to this kind of thinking in my mind with past history y'all I'm metaphorically what is it fig leaves or I prepare myself for the death of a loved one in advance and when death comes you can't handle it you've lost your mind fig leaves you've got to have the blood of Jesus and not fig leaf religion give me something else fig leaves not fig leaves religion when I come into church on Sunday morning I don't want fig leaf singing I need something to handle my issues I need real religion nobody wants to talk about the blood anymore you bow your heads. Take the person by the hand next to you. I've been a kid. I'm not pointing at you. I'm pointing at myself. I thought I could handle life sometimes with issues in my own life. If only I would do this and that. When I found my paradise, my garden, my place of comfort threatened. Sometimes Satan has even spoken into my own mind and heart. And I went that route knowing I should have done something different and discovered down the road it was nothing but fig leaves. But I need blood of religion. I need to know that by his stripes where blood was shed on Calvary 
that I'm healed. I need to know that when I want to cover my house, I cannot cover my house with my finances only, with my good conversation, with my love, with my presence. I need to do just like the children of Israel did. I need to cover the doorposts with blood. All through the Old Testament into the New Testament, out of the New Testament into the book of Revelation, you find that blood is a common thread, but it must be the blood of Jesus Christ. And God is saying to somebody here today, Adam and Eve, where are you? I want you to come back into a relationship with me. I want you to return to the church. I want you to be a part of my kingdom. I did it all for you on Calvary. If you're here today and you don't have a church home, I'm going to invite you to unite with our church.